Welcome to the May 2023 Recreational Astronomy Night meeting uh, of the RASC Toronto Centre. My name is Paul Markov and I'll be your host for this evening. Um, we are uh, coming to you live from the Ontario Science Centre in front of an audience of about 20 people. Uh, to our online viewers, uh, a reminder that we have resumed in-person meetings here, uh, so if you can, please join us next time. Uh, for those who definitely cannot make it, uh, because you may be far, far away, don't worry, uh, we will continue broadcasting these meetings online. Uh, thanks to our superb AV team, uh, comprised of Andrew and Betty Reed, Ward Legro, Anu Chalucci, and Reza Mohammed. Uh, thank you for making these meetings possible for us. And as you know, I'm always on the lookout for presentations. Um, our June meeting is now full, but we have um, openings for the July 5 uh, meeting. Um, Future meetings, uh, which occur on the first Wednesday of each month, also have uh, available time slots. Uh, this evening, we have three presentations as usual, and uh, they are as follows. Uh, Andy Beaton will talk to us about the sky this month. Um, then we'll have uh, Clay Davis. He'll, he'll talk to us about uh, telescope uh, mirror making, a superb polish with a cheap but vile, slow, messy slurry. And uh, John Percy is uh, back, um, and unfortunately we had uh, technical issues last meeting, so he's back presenting uh, the mysterious long secondary periods in um, Red Giants, explained or not. Uh, then our president, Tom Luton, who's usually here in person, uh, will close the meeting, but online this time with uh, announcements, and uh, we expect to be done around 9.30. If you are watching us online and have a question, please enter it in the uh, chat box and uh, well, someone here will ask uh, the question on your behalf to the speaker. And for in-room questions, please hang on until we get you a microphone before you ask your question. Otherwise, uh, the online folks won't be able to uh, uh, hear you. The mic is over there. Very good, thank you. And then, let's see, a uh, show of hands, do we have somebody here for the first time, member or not? It does not matter. We have uh, just, uh, four, three, four people or so. Okay, very good, welcome. <laughs> and uh, also, if you're uh, watching us online for the first time, uh, please uh, say hello through the chat box and let us know where you're from. Um, so let's get the meeting started with uh, Andy and this guy this month. Wow, this is so exciting, live human beings. Uh, my name's Andy Beaton. I'm an amateur astronomer living here in Toronto, and uh, I'm here to talk about uh, the sky this month. People who have uh, been through my talks before know the uh, routine. We start with the big picture, uh, go through key dates, talk about the moon, the planets, something from the deep sky, a double star, a variable star because that's my thing, and whatever's coming up in space flight that's interesting. So heading out tonight, uh, peering through the clouds, this is what we'd be seeing. Our uh, usual uh, winter constellations uh, drifting off to the sunset, and we've got our spring constellations up in the sky, uh, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, and so on. Uh, planets, yeah, we're not seeing Oh, sorry, I'm not loud enough? Okay. Sorry, okay. Planets, uh, we've definitely got uh, Venus uh, up there in the evening, which I'm sure you've all seen on whatever clear skies we've had. Other than that, uh, very faint Mars, and not much else in the way of exciting planets. However, if we show up uh, early in the morning before the next meeting, early June, then we see the good planets showing up. We've got uh, Jupiter and Saturn there, uh, Uranus and Neptune will be available, and uh, by uh, early morning June, we've, we're well into our big summer constellations. Uh, the whole summer Milky Way will be up there, so we've got uh, everything from Sagittarius up to Cygnus and beyond. So the nights are getting shorter. This is... Uh, that time of year where uh, we get less and less time for those long exposure photographs. Uh, twilight tonight, twilight in the next couple of days, ending uh, not long after 10, starting up again at 345. 
but by the next meeting, we've lost an hour at uh, bedtime and another hour in the morning. So the nights are going to be quite short for observing, at least in uh, this latitude. Important dates coming up. We've got the new moon. That's what we all plan our observing around. Uh, moon is at Apogee, which is, uh, I put a note in there, which means far, on May 26th, and Perigee on May 11th. Uh, if you're looking for a uh, good observing project, try measuring the size of the moon on those two dates or taking pictures of the moon with uh, the same equipment and uh, compare the sizes. Uh, full moon, we've got two full moons this time, uh, May 5th and June 4th. Uh, we have a penumbral lunar eclipse coming up on May 5th. Uh, we aren't going to see it. It's going to be on the other side of the world. And even if you are on the other side of the world, it's going to be pretty dull. You're going to see the moon going in the, uh, the faintest part of the shadow of the Earth. Uh, but I'm thinking that uh, now that we're on the Internet, maybe somebody is out there in Australia yearning to see a penumbral uh, lunar eclipse. So this is your big chance. We have the Eta Aquarian meteor shower coming up on May 5th, and I'll discuss that later. So we've got the moon, uh, first quarter coming up uh, on May 27th. Uh, we've got the full moon now, last quarter on the 12th, new moon on the 19th. Uh, we've got the lunar X coming up on May 27th. And for those who don't know what that is, that's a, a pair of craters side by side. And at a certain time of the year or a certain time of the month, the sunlight glances across them at just the right angle and it looks like a lit up X against the dark uh, lunar surface. It's kind of cool. It's uh, 2.41 in the morning, so uh, you'd want to stay up for it. Uh, May 28th is when the uh, lunar straight wall is illuminated in a, a way that makes it show up best. Um, it'll be visible for most of the evening, so that one's not quite so time constrained. We've got planets. Mercury, however, is not going to be one of them. We'll get a bit of a view of it uh, in the morning, halfway through the month, but it won't be an outstanding uh, apparition this time. Venus, on the other hand, is unmistakable. Uh, look to the west at night. It's bright. It's visible. It's that thing that looks like the airplane that isn't landing. If you, if you watch for it throughout the, the month, you can be able to see that it is changing its shape as it approaches us. So at sunset, we also have uh, Mars to the west. Uh, it's distant. It's low in the sky. It's going to be small. Uh, by the time twilight is over, it's going to be in a rotten position to view, but it will look red. And if you know people who have never seen the planet Mars and want to have a look and say, there's that red thing, and they will understand that, yeah, Mars really is a red planet. So the good planets are going to be in the morning. Uh, Jupiter, by the end of the month, uh, it'll be uh, well out of the morning twilight. Uh, but even when it is twilight, it's still going to be a pretty spectacular object. You're going to see the cloud belts. You're going to see the major moons. Um, maybe the red spot. That would uh, take a certain amount of luck. But before that, we have Saturn rising. And it's about two hours ahead of Jupiter. Uh, by the time you're uh, up and set up in the morning, it's going to be a really nice object. It's be high enough that... Uh, Anybody you can talk into uh, getting up that early to have a look at it is going to be really impressed. Uranus and Neptune. Well, Uranus, it's too close to the sun. We're not going to see much of it this time. Uh, Neptune uh, rises after Saturn. It doesn't get very high before twilight, and it's not going to be very bright, and it's pretty far away. So. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't plan my schedule around seeing Neptune for this month, at least. On the other hand, we do have uh, minor planets, which will make uh, good objects. Um, by the time we get to the end of the month, uh, when morning twilight is uh, just about done, uh, Pluto will be up near the uh, 
uh, near the meridian. It'll be as about as high as it gets. It's uh, in Capricornus, so it's uh, finally getting away from the, the mess of the Milky Way. It's probably worth uh, starting to look for it again. Um, easiest way is to take pictures a few days apart and look for that moving object. But uh, with a telescope, 10 inches or higher, you should be able to actually see it with an eyeball. Um, I've glimpsed it once with an 8-inch under outstanding conditions, but uh, I've tried it uh, several times and never repeated, so your mileage may vary, of course. The other uh, minor planet we'll be able to see is Ceres, and it is going to be, a if you're an asteroid hunter, a minor planet hunter, this is a perfect time for it. It's bright, it's seventh magnitude, it's 0.61, one arc seconds across, so if you really crank up the magnification, you may be able to see a disk. Uh, I would be very curious if anybody listening to this talk uh, actually gets a chance to try that and uh, let me know what results you get. I'm very curious. So as always, I like to throw in a, a bit of deep sky stuff. Um, M104, the Sombrero Galaxy, is the one I picked this month. Um, it's a nice big uh, eighth magnitude galaxy. You can find it with binoculars. If you have a look at it through a telescope, you can see it's got a pointy spindle shape and you can see the dust lane going through it. Um, it is pretty far south, so try and time your observations of it uh, close to when it's at the meridian. You know, get the, the best sky possible because it's worth it. It's a really interesting galaxy. It's insanely huge. And uh, here, here's a picture of it. This is from the uh, Space Telescope. Uh, that dust lane is just so cool. I, I made this the uh, screen on my, uh, my work computer because I'm just so fascinated by this picture. The, the, you can see the globular clusters in there and some background galaxies. A very cool object. I like it a lot. But for those of you looking for something a bit more challenging, um, who have done your Messier lists and seen the, the spindle-shaped galaxy, I'm going to suggest a Quasar 3C273. It's also in Virgo, and it's a galaxy with an extremely active core. There's a ton of material pouring into the black hole at the center of this galaxy. Uh, it's insanely far away, so this extremely bright thing just looks like a star in the sky. It's, uh, which means because it's so concentrated, you can see it from the city. I've actually measured it a few times from my backyard around Bathurst and Bloor, and uh, there's not much light pollution worse than that. So 12.9 magnitude, more or less. This is the cool thing. It's variable. It changes. And if you want to be a scientist and record the uh, brightness, the American Association of Variable Star Observers wants your data. Uh, they are tracking this. They've been tracking it for decades. Uh, professional astronomers don't have time to go out and measure it every time, so it's up to us amateurs to uh, gather that data. And if you want to, once you've seen it, you can go to your friends and boast that you have seen 2.2 billion years into the past, before life even existed on Earth, or if it did, it was... Uh, very, very simple stuff. So comets and meteors, uh, we do have meteors coming up. The Eta Aquariids, um, this one is, is going to be a big ripoff. It's uh, under a full moon. Uh, you're not going to see any, very few of them, but you might see some of the really bright ones. And if you see those, that makes it worth going out. Uh, potentially up to 60 meteors an hour. Um, I don't know what we'll actually see, but, uh, you know, if it's clear, we should give it a try. Uh, minor showers, the Eta Lyriids uh, for the first half of the month, uh, the Tau Herculids and the daytime Aeriids will be out there as well. Uh, I wouldn't actually make the effort to go out and look for these things, but if you happen to see a meteor while you're out observing and trace it back to uh, the center of Lyra, then you have a pretty good idea that you're looking at one of those, uh, those minor meteor showers. 
Comments, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty dull month for comets. Uh, the best thing we have is a 9.7 magnitude comet in Aries, uh, C2020 V2ZTF. Um, the others, uh, we're getting down past 10th magnitude, uh, K2 pan stars, K5 pan stars, and that one's not even visible around here. That one I've thrown in for our listeners in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, A2 pan stars in Andromeda, and uh, we all know E3ZTF. Was, was that the biggest ripoff of a comet you've ever seen? <laughs> all, all that hype and what a letdown. So we also have Aurora to watch for. We're in solar cycle 25 and solar activity is on the rise. We had a big night of aurora a few weeks ago. Those of us in Toronto had an excellent look at the clouds obscuring them, but uh, we got to uh, suffer in envy at uh, people posting all the pictures they'd taken of aurora all around uh, North America. If it could happen then, it can happen again. Um, keep an eye on spaceweather.com. That's the uh, go-to website for maps and up-to-date forecasts. If it looks like it's going to be a clear tonight, a clear night, you know, take a minute, check it, see if there's going to be aurora coming. And if there are, spread the news because they're super cool things to see. So I always like to throw in a, a, a multiple star or a double star for uh, for Blake, who I didn't see here tonight. Um, 35 coma Berenice is the one that I thought looked interesting this time. It's a pretty a pretty nice looking uh, double star, 5.1 magnitude, 7.2. Uh, pretty tightly separated, so you want to crank up the magnification. And this is the thing that got my attention. The Night Sky Observer's Guide says the secondary is purple. I have never seen a purple star. And since I read that, of course, it's been cloudy all week, and uh, I've been, I haven't been able to check this observation. So... Once again, I'm going to appeal to the people uh, listening to this talk, uh, get out and have a look and see what uh, color that star is and uh, report back on, uh, on the chat uh, following this YouTube uh, presentation. I would be very curious to see uh, what actual live observers have to say about this. Now, I can't go without a variable star. It wouldn't be my presentation if we didn't. Arbuotis is uh, the one I picked this week or this month. Um, it's, it's not a, a hard one to find. It goes from six magnitude down to 13.3 magnitude and changes brightness every 13 days. It is uh, what we call a Myra type variable. And uh, these are red giants near the end of their life cycle. Um, they are unstable, they contract, uh, they heat up, it makes them expand, they cool, they contract, and materials constantly being spat out into space. It will eventually end up as a planetary nebula. Now, the interesting thing about this is uh, it's what the AAVSO calls a legacy campaign star. Um, I'm sure you know that uh, there's all kinds of automated sky surveys uh, getting to work, recording everything in the night sky every three or four nights. And those things are ideally suited for gathering data on long period variable stars like this. However, they have about 100 years worth of data on this star. And in order to calibrate what they're recording from the sky surveys with what they've recorded from observers over many decades, they need amateur observers to keep observing it and to report the brightness so they can uh, draw a, a correlation between what the uh, automated telescopes and uh, what we with our eyeballs have observed. So feel free to step in and observe some of these uh, nice, easy uh, Myra variable stars and uh, contribute your bit to science. So coming up in space flight, uh, new discoveries from uh, the James Webb Telescope are always coming along. 
The uh, Peregrine Robotic Lunar Lander is uh, being launched sometime within the next few weeks or the next few months, depending on how things go. It's supposed to be soon, but we all know how these things go. Uh, Tropic Cyclone Monitoring uh, satellites are being launched on May 3rd and 15th. Uh, more Falcon 9s than I could bother counting. There's a whole bunch of them. They're, they're launching those annoying uh, Starlink satellites. But, uh, you know, if you're in Florida and you want to see a space launch, uh, people who have seen them tell me they're pretty spectacular. The Perseverance rover is uh, dropping soil samples for later pickup on Mars. Um, keep an eye on that uh, on the NASA website. The space station's passing overhead uh, early morning until May 14th and then late evening until May 31st. And after that, then it's going to be in a an orbit where it doesn't pass over Toronto. Uh, Heavensabove.com is the place to go for uh, times and locations of ISS passes and other interesting satellites that uh, happen to be up there. Yeah, talking about the JOS, JWST, I just had to throw this into the uh, presentation. This is the planet Uranus in infrared light. Are those rings cool or what? I mean, that's... Uh, that's the kind of thing you should be looking for on the internet to see what's happening in astronomy. This is you know, something never imagined until about a month ago, and now we have it. So what if it's cloudy or the leaves are winning and uh, you don't want to go out and set up your telescope? They could be winning. Uh, Zooniverse.org has a whole bunch of citizen science projects that you can do at your computer. Um, Four arbitrary ones I picked this month that looked interesting. Uh, cosmic muon images of uh, deep sky objects. Uh, the Zwicky Chemical Factory examining nebula to see what chemicals are being produced by, uh, by supernova and uh, other interesting events in the sky. Uh, active asteroids, trying to determine what an asteroid is and what a comet is and where the uh, dividing line is between the two. And the Solar Active Region Spotter, they're uh, for your, your daytime observing needs. Have a look at images of the sun and uh, report on uh, interesting things that you see. So that's what I have for this month. Thanks very much, and I hope we have some clear skies. Thanks. I got a question about the um, uh, variable star Arbu that you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, it's period you listed it as thirteen point three days, but actually mirrors are have a year have a period typically around a year. And so I, I, I'm questioning maybe there's a typo somewhere, but maybe um, you got a computer there. Maybe you could check it, or somebody else might want to have a quick look. And I have never done a presentation yet without a typo. That looked low to me as well. Okay. I'm thinking it might have been thirty one days. Well, but, I, I'd, uh, I'd call it maybe three hundred days, but. That, um, that's very likely too. Um, um, okay, I will uh, I will check that out and get you a, a proper answer before the meeting's out. Okay, uh, not that it matters much because it's uh, it's an inter interesting star. It begs uh, observations. So just go and observe it and measure it, right? So that's the bottom line. Yeah. Thanks for catching that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any more questions in the room? I don't see any. Okay. Uh, let's go online. Who is taking online questions this evening? Emma, okay, Emma, um, go ahead. Hi, we did not get any questions online. Okay. Okay, very good. All right, thank you. All right, so thank you so much, Andy. Great presentation as usual, and uh, I'm glad uh, we were not competing with the
polish. Or maybe you're not really interested in making a mirror, but you might be interested in buying a mirror, and you wonder if it may be worthwhile investing those extra hard-earned dollars in a really good mirror with a really good polish and good figure and so on. And the answer comes down to one word, contrast, contrast. That's what you're after when you're, you're looking for a really good polish, really good figure, really good mirror. We have a friend of common, I think a lot of us, uh, I like to call this gentleman the king of contrast. I'm sure that some of you have looked through a telescope that might have one of his mirrors in it. And I think that some of you might guess his name, Carl Zambudo. How many of you here have had a look through a telescope with a Carl Zambudo mirror in it? A few of you, okay. What do you think of it? Yeah, they're, they're pretty amazing. I've looked through a bunch of telescopes with Carl Zambuto mirrors in them, and they are real performers. There are some other really good opticians out there, but uh, I think that Zambuto is really something else. I, I've never seen any, anyone, any telescope that had one of his mirrors in it that wasn't spectacular. In any case, right on his website, Carl states that contrast isn't everything. But outside of aperture, it's the only thing. So we've all heard that aperture rules, but I'd like to add contrast counts. Now, you might wonder just how does he do it? Well, how does he make these mirrors that are so good they seem almost magical? Well, He's got seven criteria for optical performance. Some opticians, they just use two. And number one on his list is, well, it has to do with polish. Now, Mr. Zambudo is known for achieving a remarkably good polish on his uh, mirrors. He used to polish for at least 30 hours before he started figuring. And now he does a lot more than that. You might wonder why. He's a professional. For him, time is money. So why would he invest so much time polishing and polishing and polishing those mirrors? And I think that some of you can guess the answer. That's right, contrast, once again. Now, Jean Texero, he was one of the great opticians of the 20th century, and he said that a polished mirror is a nearly finished mirror. A polished mirror is a nearly finished mirror. So if you really want your mirror done right, you want, you want to be sure it's really well polished. And he also said that it's really important to have a regular surface form. Now, what exactly does he mean by that? A regular surface form. You want it to be smooth. Now, a telescope mirror, as long as it's smooth, it can produce a very good image as long as it's, say, smooth from edge to edge. It can be overcorrected or undercorrected. As long as it's smooth within that quarter wave or that fifth wave or tenth wave or what have you, it should really perform well. So smooth is good at every scale. Now, by contrast, let's imagine you're standing in front of a funhouse mirror. It's got ripples in it and funny shapes, so it doesn't, it behaves a little funny. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, that, that guy does not need a binocular. So if your optics aren't smooth, things can get ugly. What happens when things get ugly? 
surface ripple can cause scattering of light and a serious loss of contrast. There it is again, contrast. That's Bob Royce, another maker of mirrors who's just a fantastic mirror that he's made. Uh, uh, retired now, but wow, he could make a fantastic mirror. Now let's just say that this is a good mirror. We've got light coming in from the right from a distant star at infinity, and it reflects off the mirror and passes right through the airy disk, right there, right there. About 84% of the disk, if it's a good mirror, should pass through that. Now, let's say on the other hand that you've got a mirror that's rough. It may have zones, it may have ripple, it may have astigmatism. And what does it do? It scatters light all over the place. You can see there's still a bit of a concentration. Oh boy, that is ugly. But just again, it's Bob Royce. He says it scatters light. So not only is there light lost from where it should go, a bright star will appear dimmer, but also where it should be utterly black, like space just beside the moon or Jupiter, or the floor of a lunar crater that's in shadow. It won't look black. It will look gray. You could even drive for hours and hours out to a really beautiful black sky and if you look through the telescope, it might not look so dark. So it's not only the size of the error that causes a problem, it's the slope of the error that can reduce contrast ultimately. So that's what you don't want. That's what you do want. That's what you don't want. That's what you do want. Now, I'm a visual observer and a telescope maker. Uh, I did not go to college to study optics, anything like that. What I've learned about optics has largely been uh, from being an amateur photographer for, since I was a teenager, and also, but mostly from being a visual observer and telescope maker. Uh, I've looked through probably, I'm sure, well over 100 telescopes, every different type of telescope, different uh, sizes, different qualities, and so on. So that's what I've learned about optics. I built a number of telescopes, and I like to build things generally. And it, it seemed inevitable that sooner or later I would make my own mirror. And without a master standing by my side, guiding me every step of the way, I had to be meticulous uh, uh, to make every make sure that everything was done right, because I'm fussy about optics. I got used to really good optics early when I got back into astronomy. Um, so I built a Foucault tester from the Stellafane design. And after about an hour of polishing my mirror, when I got it that far, I broke the rules. They say, no, 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 don't look at your mirror before it's fully polished. But I did anyway, and I took this image. It was polished out in the center, and after about three hours, that polish was approaching the edge. After about 10 hours, you might just be able to see just off to the right there, there's a little dot. This is a red laser being shone upon the mirror, and this little red laser dot appears on the front surface of the mirror. Well, I didn't like that uh, because that can cause lost contrast. That indicates that the mirror is not as well polished as it could be. Now, the brighter red dot just underneath that is actually on the back surface of the mirror and the plywood. And near the center of the mirror, there is just a faint pink glow that's reflecting up from the back of the mirror through the front of the mirror again. It, it indicates that it is rough and that will scatter light and it will reduce contrast. Well, I kept on, I kept on polishing and polishing and I tried different things. And then after I was up to about 80 hours of polishing, something happened. Yeah, 
We were all dressed up with no place to go. Fortunately, I had something better to do than watching Dancing with the Stars sitting on the couch. I had a mirror to make, so I had a lot of time on my hands to try everything, to get that polish better and to learn more about mirror making. And after about 80 hours, I still had that red dot on the mirror. Well, I tried everything. I took it all the way back to fine grinding to make absolutely sure I had no pits. I was sure I had no pits in the first place, but just to be absolutely sure, I took it back to fine grinding. I tried messing with the pH level. I tried polishing pads. I even built this contraption. I call it a polishing wrench to put a lot of pressure on the mirror. And that only made things worse. It put a really rough surface in the mirror. The next summer, I uh, borrowed uh, Mark's, Mark Kay's machine. Thank you very much, Mark. And I made some concrete tools and I polished by machine. Up to that time, I was polishing by hand. Still, there it was, that red laser scatter. It was driving me nuts. I mean, you can actually see that red laser scatter on the mirror. Uh, now, in fact, reflected on a piece of smooth white bristle board that looked like a freaking redshift galaxy. Like, I mean, I didn't want my stars to look like galaxies. I want my stars to look like stars. I want my galaxies to look like galaxies. This wouldn't do. I was going crazy. And a certain gentleman who is pretty well known, he said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. So in the interest of preserving my sanity, I had to ask myself, what was I doing over and over? Polishing with cerium oxide for over a hundred hours at this point. So I had to ask myself, what had I not yet tried? I hadn't tried the cheapest, slowest, messiest, most reviled polishes of all, red rouge and black rouge because they had bad reputations. People said they were messy and slow. Red Rouge made sleeks and Black Rouge was incredibly slow. On online forums, people wrote, don't use these slow, messy, vile polishes. Use cerium oxide, it's just as good. What does Carl Zambudo use to polish? Trick question. I didn't, I didn't know it yet, but Carl uses cerium oxide to polish. I knew that much. But what I found out just recently is that he uses red rouge, decanted ball milled red rouge for final figuring. I didn't know it yet. Meanwhile, I tried every technique I could find, but I failed to get the polish I wanted with cerium oxide. And I was desperate to find a solution. So it got me thinking. I ground through many grits from very coarse to very fine. And that worked great for grinding. I mean, the Final, pol uh, final gr grid of grinding, it got it to a, I could see, I could see a reflection on it. But it just, the, the cerium oxide didn't get any better. So why not apply the same principle for polishing? I knew that polish came in different sizes, different particle sizes, and some of them were a whole lot smaller than cerium oxide. Over on the right, that's aluminum oxide. That's the final one of the, the finest one of the fine polishes that I used. To the left of that, cerium oxide in yellow. And just there, about the size of Spain on this world map, 
that would be about red rouge, average size. And above that, tiny, tiny black rouge, comparatively speaking, about the size of England or Ireland. Just look at how small that is compared to the cerium oxide. So why not take polishing two steps finer? Gave it a try. I decanted red rouge and polished for five more hours on the machine and the red laser sparkle was gone, baby, gone. Which goes to show you that nothing is impossible for the fool who refuses to listen to common sense. So I was pretty happy with the polish at long last. The mirror at this point actually looks smoother than that. What looks like ripple at the bottom is actually um, airways between, uh, say, warm air and cool air mixing between the mirror and the camera lens when I took this image. But right in the center, you can see there's a little hill. And around that, there's a little ring. So I was advised to build a barrel and polish by hand from that point. So I took the Stella Fane's ASGH wooden barrel design, excellent design, very sturdy, put some nice clamps on it. And because I was now figuring, I switched to a natural pitch, Google's 64, and an ultra fine black rouge. Now, this is something you gotta do outside, folks, because man, this natural pitch stinks when you heat it up. It's also really messy. So if you're worried about rouge, be it red rouge or black rouge being messy, don't worry about it if you're already using natural pitch because natural pitch is a whole lot mess, uh, messier by far. Fortunately, with a scrubby and some dishwashing liquid, it comes out just fine, except from your clothes. Dedicate some clothes to the task. You're not using them for anything else. Is It's never coming out. Well, in spite of that, I really liked working with the, uh, the natural pitch. It conformed to the mirror very well. It did need more frequent lap maintenance. I had to channel more often. I had to scratch more often and brush it more often, but it was a joy to work with. Compared to polishing mads on the left, uh, which are produced a very rough finish, but polished fast. Some people like them. Uh, compared to the red rouge, which did a whole lot better with the uh, Aculap, but the uh, hand figuring with the black rouge, the polish got even better. In fact, it got so good that even in a room that was completely dark, I could not see a trace of red laser sparkle. So, is black rouge redundant? Is that level of polish redundant? Some people think it is. They say that cerium oxide polish is just as good as rouge. Sure, again, Carl Zambuto polishes with cerium oxide, but he uses ball milled decanted red rouge for the last 10 hours of figuring. Mark Cowan said that a micro finish improvement over the entire mirror with black rouge is anything but slight. So in summary, Black Rouge, is it cheap? Yes, it is. And it's available in small quantities. You don't have to buy a big, heavy 20 kilogram pail of this stuff for 1800 bucks American. I got it for under $20 Canadian from Amazon. Is it messy? Yes, it is but it's not nearly as messy as natural pitch. Is it slow? Yes, it is. But I found that a well-loaded lap can work surprisingly fast. And as a bonus, 
a slow working polish can really help you get a really good polish, a, a very good figure on your, your mirror. You can sneak up on it slowly rather than overshooting and having to go back and back this way, back to it. You can just approach it slowly until you arrive. So all in all, in my very humble amateur opinion, the benefits of rouge far outweigh the drawbacks. So if you really want high contrast, and you really do want high contrast, you want to polish a lot, and you want to polish smooth. So don't be afraid of the dark. Try black rouge. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Clay. All uh, right. Any questions in the room? We've got, uh, we'll start here with Frank. Is it a little closer to me? Uh, so, Clay, um, uh, given that you mentioned the um, uh, importance of contrast, made, made by, mentioned by some of the masters, um, and so wouldn't uh, most mirror makers want that high contrast? And so, have you encountered any reason why they um, continue to prefer using cerium oxide? rather than uh, discovering and using rouge like you did? Well, I, th I think that cerium oxide is a very good polish. Uh, it's, it's fast and I, I won't stop using it because it's a long way to go in between rouge and say a, uh, a five micron polish or rather uh, the last of the last of the grits when you're grinding, the fine grinding. So I'll continue to use cerium oxide, but I will continue to use certainly red rouge. If I make a faster mirror, maybe I'll just stick with red rouge for final figuring like Mr. Zambudo does. Um, personally, I favor long, slow uh, telescope mirrors mostly because I live in the city and I do a lot of lunar and planetary observing at high magnification. Uh, I don't get out to dark sky as often as I'd like to, but there, well, yeah, I'd like a faster mirror. So for, for something faster, maybe F6, maybe F4, who knows, down the road, uh, there might be a big fast mirror in my future. So I might use serum oxide until right to the very end. I hope that answers your question. No, not really. Oh, really? <laughs> My question was, have you found any reason why uh, more amateurs or more mirror makers aren't discovering what you're discovering, that for high contrast, they need to use rouge, or why are they complacent using cerium oxide? I think it's the bad reputation, because that kept me away from it for a long, long time. Um, I didn't try it because people said, oh, it's messy, it's, it causes leaks. In fact, I did earlier try red rouge. I didn't decant it. I didn't know that little trick. And uh, when I looked into it farther, I found that you could ball mill it. You could get a uh, like a rock tumbler, put in some ball bearings and the red rouge and tumble that for a couple of weeks, be really noisy. Well, that would drive me nuts. But if you just decant it, um, like a fine wine, uh, just let it settle for a minute or two and then pour off the top half of it and then do that again, stir it up, pour off the top half of it again, then that can produce a very good polish that, uh, that will not cause leaks in my experience. So I think they've, these, rouge, these rouges, be it red rouge or black, have got a bad rap, in my opinion, for finishing. They are, they are slower, and putting aside that sleek problem, if you decant it, you can get around that problem. And uh, it's been well known for a long time, say back in the 70s, uh, Jean Texero was using red rouge for the final polish that he puts on his mirrors. Some opticians use it today. Um, I think it's really just, it, it's got a bad reputation. Maybe some people are in a hurry, they just want to get out there and observe. Maybe they don't observe at high magnification. Maybe at lower magnification, 
uh, maybe a really low magnification doesn't make that much difference. But even at medium magnification, I find that that extra contrast really delivers a fine image to the eyepiece. So in my opinion, it's worth putting in an extra five hours, six hours, 10 hours in order to get that. Um, another reason why it may not be so popular is everything else has to be good. The mirror does have to be smooth in order to really gain the full advantage uh, of such a fine polish. It's got to have a good figure. It's got to have uh, no ripple, be it a primary ripple, which is fairly large in scale, or secondary ripple, micro ripple, which is, that does have to do with the polish itself. So I think that if amateurs and professionals even do some experiments with this stuff, even just a plain piece of glass and try that red laser or try that halogen beam uh, on that polished glass surface, I think that they'll be pretty impressed with what the results they can get. It's, uh, it's another level. It, it, you'll need to put in a few hours to really get the benefit of it. But even a little bit, according to Mark Cowan, uh, can make a big difference. Even if you don't take it right down to the bottom of the pits that are left by cerium oxide, if you just flatten out the top of it, the results can be spectacular. All right. I know we had a question here from earlier. First, uh, absolutely amazing. Um, all those hours, uh, all that work, working towards a quality result, uh, trial and error. Uh, I've really got two questions for you. I think they're fast. Mm -hmm. The first one, um, all that work, was that all on one glass blank or did you have to stop and go back and to try again? No, that was one piece of glass. One piece of glass. It's my first mirror. It is an eight inch. It'll end up being around eight inch F8. Okay, amazing. Um, the second question is, I can kind of understand how you could um, achieve a spherical mirror. Uh, mm -hmm. Doing this yourself, you know, the geometry of a, of a sphere isn't that difficult. How on earth do you get a parabolic shape at the end? What, how do you do that? Uh, I guess that the short answer to that one is it ain't easy. But uh, you've got different tests to use, such as the Foucault tester, there's the raunchy tester and there's the star test. Those are three commonly used um, methods of testing the mirror to check the figure. And you can, there are various different ways of changing that into a parabolic shape. You can have to work, say, on the just the inside and make, making it a deeper dish or you can work just the outside and make it a shallower uh, dish that's, that can turn it into a parabola as well. Or you can work both the inner area and the outer area. So paradoxically, there's three basic different ways you can achieve that parabola. Um, depending on how it comes out of polishing, because it might not be a perfect spear, and it probably won't be, but uh, it'll be pretty close and from there as long as it's smooth and ideally it has no turn down edge no zones no ripples well it, as long as it's smooth you can achieve that parabola by established methods my pleasure uh, i'm new to this please mm -hmm. can you tell me what a quarter two questions what a quarter wave means. And I'd like to know, if I already have a mirror in my telescope, is there any way to improve it? Okay. The quarter wave, it would refer to a quarter wavelength of light. And you want the wave front error, as I recall, to be within that established one quarter wave. If you can do that, about 84% of that light is going to pass through the airy disk, which it, the size of which is determined by the focal ratio of the optic. Um, you can take it beyond that, say that uh, that would be diffraction limited, they say. You could take it, say, up to a fifth wave, a sixth wave, a tenth wave. 
But beyond about an eighth wave, you're starting to get diminish, ret diminishing, diminishing returns. It gets to be harder and harder to make the mirror better and better than that. It gets harder to test it, and it's a lot more work for a lot less return. But if you can get it to, say, an eighth wave, a tenth wave, that is going to be a, one very good mirror if it's smooth all the way across. That has to do with the figure of the mirror, the, just the general shape. Within that, then there is the, the ripple and zones and stigmatism, things like that. So you also want that to be basically non-existent for a perfect mirror. Now, there is no perfect mirror, but you can have a mirror that's for all practical purposes that it really is perfect. Now, a mirror that you've got, it is quite a lot to make it better. Uh, I would say that few amateurs today will want to parabolize it themselves unless I would say the, the less risky thing to do is to make your own mirror from scratch. And that, that'll be quite a learning experience. And then by that time, you'll picked up a lot of the skills that will be beneficial um, for figuring. You could refigure the mirror yourself, but I would say probably best to either take it to a professional who could refigure it for you. Um, you could talk to, say, Norman Fulham, for example, uh, who's just down the highway just outside of uh, Montreal. I'm sure he'd be happy to do that for you. And uh, he's, he's a great guy, and he can make one beautiful mirror as well. Uh, so that is an option. But really, the mirror itself isn't the only thing which will deliver a beautiful view to the eyepiece. There are other things that you can do that can help you get the most out of your telescope, such as uh, you, should, you want to really nail that collimation. If you can learn how to star test collimate, you can do it with a laser, you can do it with uh, uh, various other methods. But if you learn to star test collimate, ideally it's with two people, one person looking through the eyepiece while the other one twists the knobs, then that will, that'll really help to really nail that collimation. If the mirror is cooled to ambient air temperature, that also will help a great deal, a tremendous amount. Uh, in fact, big mirrors tend to have a problem with cooling to the ambient air temperature and uh, temperature control of the mirror. They put a lot of fans on it and so on in order to chase the following air temperature and keep the mirror at that same air temperature. So those are a couple of things you can do without refiguring that can really make a big difference. If you can um, keep the mirror as cool as the outside air temperature, collimate it very well, then I'd say you're getting, you, you can really get the most out of the mirror. And I might add that even your basic commercial mirrors today, by and large, can be very good. Uh, for example, I had a, a GSO, it was a Mead Lightbridge 10 inch F5, which was really good. It really surprised me just how good it was. Uh, it had a very good figure. In fact, I star tested that. It blew my mind how good it was for just a, like a cheap commercial telescope. Uh, I might have got lucky on the optics, or maybe GSO is usually that good. I, I'm not really sure. But um, I would say those are the things to do first. If you take care of collimation and thermals, then I'd say that will take you at least 80% of the way there. Any more questions in the room? No? Okay, how about online? Uh, Emma, do we have anything online? Yeah, we did. Uh, we got a question from Ralph who wants to know, although all the abrasives and polishing materials are considered non-toxic and environmentally stable, they do present a problem of disposal. How do you dispose of them? And would you pour a rouge slurry into a septic system? Sorry, I couldn't make out what you said. Okay, can you hear me better now? Uh, oh, uh, that is, it's actually kind of like beach sand. Um, the, you can dispose of it in regular garbage. The, the water you've got to, uh, don't pour it down your toilet, don't pour it down your sink. 
but get rid of the the water, let it settle, and uh, then you can you can package it up and you can just dispose of it in regular garbage. It just has a consistency pretty much like beach sand. But don't put it down your drain, or else you're really asking for trouble. It'll harden like concrete. Great, thank you. That's all the questions we got online. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clay. Right. Uh, great presentation. Thank I can you. see you're very passionate about the topic. Mm -hmm. And um, I have already uh, spoken to uh, Clay about having him back uh, to talk to us about the finished product in uh, the months to come. So Absolutely. Uh, when, uh, when you feel ready, let me know and uh, we'll sign you up for another presentation. All right, will do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, pleasure. Good. Um, so our next presenter is, uh, yes, is uh, John Percy. Uh, and uh, we'll go to fun facts for a moment uh, while we switch over to an online presenter. Can, can you hear and see in the room and online so we can go? Okay, well, thank you very much. I'd like to start by thanking uh, uh, the tech team for sorting out the technology here and uh, also for having me back after the technical problems that we had last time. Um, it, actually, it turns out that what I want to tell you about follows up quite nicely from where Andy left off with uh, the discussion of red giant stars and the important work that uh, skilled amateurs can do in making observations of these stars. So this is what a red giant looks like. This is a high resolution image from the European Space Agency. And red giants are dominated on their surface by huge convection cells, which you can get a sense of in this picture here. In the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which many of you are probably familiar with, that plots luminosity vertically, temperature horizontally, uh, red giants start out like stars like the sun. And as they exhaust their hydrogen fuel, they swell up, become red giants. Then they ignite their helium fuel and they start to exhaust that. They swell up some more, becoming even larger red giants. But at this point, they have a strong stellar wind, and they lose about half of their mass. It's cast off in the form of a planetary nebula, and the core of the star shrinks down and becomes a white dwarf star. So this is basically their uh, life history uh, very quickly. Uh, and uh, this is an image which shows something of the mass loss that goes on uh, when a red giant expands to its uh, full size and its uh, full luminosity. Uh, it can lose about half of its total mass in mass loss. And we believe that the mass loss is driven by the fact that the star is also pulsating. And interspersed among these, uh, this mass loss are things called helium flashes, which are nuclear instabilities in the interior of the star. And so you can see that the mass loss 
as it drifts out here is not completely uh, uniform. The other thing about red giants, and this is what's always interested me, is the fact that they pulsate. They're unstable to low order radial pulsation, that is in and out pulsation. And the pulsation period and amplitude tend to increase as the luminosity increases. So there's a period luminosity relation. So a low luminosity red giant shown on the left here uh, might pulsate with a period of, in this case, 31 days, about one month. The amplitude is measured in hundredths of a magnitude. A more luminous red giant, uh, in this case, with a period of about 100 days, has an amplitude of measured in tenths of a magnitude. And the Myra stars, which were alluded to earlier, these are the highest luminosity red giants, it has a period of 413 days. And you can see that the amplitude is measured in magnitudes. It amounts to three or four magnitudes in total. So in addition to that, it's been known for almost a century that many, that many red giant stars also have a second period. And it's five to 10 times the pulsation period. This particular table here is taken from a monumental paper by Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin, who is arguably the greatest woman astronomer of all time. And you'll notice these are the pulsation periods, and in this third column are the uh, uh, long secondary periods. And Nancy Houck in 1963 provided a list of over 100 of these stars, uh, which had been accumulated mostly by photo photographic photometry at the Harvard College Observatory, which is what HCO stands for here. Incidentally, uh, the people that did most of the work, the research assistants at the Harvard College Observatory were virtually all women. And some of them became very famous and their names are in textbooks now because of the things that they discovered. Uh, they were unfortunately paid less than male uh, research uh, technicians would be paid. That was the way it was at the time but I suppose the director's uh, budget went a little bit further. Now, just as an aside, um, I looked at Houck's list here, and there were 37 stars that had good follow-up observations for several decades. And I redetermined their periods of pulsation and also their long secondary periods. And in 33 out of 37 cases, uh, the periods that I found were um, the same as the ones that uh, were listed in Hauk. So with photographic photometry, they were 90% accurate in determining the periods of these stars. Another interesting development is that all of this Harvard College Observatory photoelectric data, photometric data is being digitized in a project called DASH, Digital Access to a Sky Century of Data at Harvard. Uh, this project is coming along rather slowly, but it'll be very interesting to have all that data available. Now, what happened was that Harvard basically phased out its uh, uh, photographic photometry program in the mid uh, 20th century. But very fortunately, skilled amateur astronomers through the American Association of Variable Star Observers, which has already been mentioned, uh, picked up the baton there and ran with it. In this light curve here, uh, magnitude uh, brightening upwards, time along the bottom. This is almost a century of data here on a star called y Linksis here. And this star has a pulsation period of 134.7 days. And what we've done here is to basically bin or average the data in 134-day um, bins and now you can see in red here the long secondary period. You can see how con consistent it is here. Uh, its value is 1,259 days. Uh, this particular work was done by a brilliant undergraduate student, Emily Debert, and followed up by another student, Henry Leung, who's just completing his PhD in the astronomy department. He's uh, one of my colleagues. 
And so this kind of data was av is, is available for dozens of red giant stars. And uh, it was mentioned earlier how useful it would be for some of you to go out and observe uh, red giant stars. And this is the kind of science that can be done uh, with it. Now, about 1980, a couple of developments took place. One is that robotic telescopes started to be developed. And some of the early work was done by amateur astronomers such as Russ Genet. Um, this particular light curve here, this is about 10 years of data on a red giant star here. On the right is one season of data. So you can see the uh, pulsation period here. But you can see over here the long secondary period uh, that's uh, uh, in this star, which is about 10 times the pulsation period. This is from some work that was done in collaboration with Greg Henry at Tennessee State University. Um, he had access to a robotic telescope. Joe Wilson was an undergraduate who actually did the analysis here. So we have data on about two dozen uh, of these red giants. The other thing that happened at the same time was that uh, amateur astronomers got into photoelectric photometry in a big way because photometers could be obtained now off the shelf uh, from people like Optech and so forth. So this is some work done on a very famous uh, uh, red giant, EU Delphini here. And uh, again, it's a light curve here. Uh, we have something of the order of uh, about a thousand days of data here. And in red, you can see the long secondary period and the scatter up and down is the pulsation period, which is about 60 days. So the amateurs were really picking up the baton here and continuing the observations of these stars. And their, uh, their observations are particularly important for long-term variations in stars, such as these long secondary periods. But in the 1990s, there was a huge development among professional astronomers of uh, automated uh, surveys of the sky. And three of them in particular, there was the, uh, the All-Sky Automated uh, Survey. Uh, MACHO was uh, massive count compact halo objects and it and Ogle, the optical gravitational lens experiment. They were particularly to look for gravitational micro lensing of stars by compact objects like black holes or neutron stars or white dwarfs uh, in the halo of our galaxy. And so they were accumulating automatically data on thousands and thousands of stars. And this is some, wood, uh, some work published by Peter Wood in Australia. Uh, again, this is a, a period luminosity relation. That's luminosity increasing upwards. Uh, these are stars in the large Magellanic cloud. And along here is the logarithm of the period. Now in this graph, you will notice a number of sequences, sequence A, sequence B, and sequence C. And these are pulsation period luminosity relations for the fundamental mode, the first overtone, and the second overtone. But on the right, you see this other sequence, sequence D, and this is a sequence of long secondary periods in these stars. And Peter Wood uh, estimates that about a third of red giant stars in his survey show long secondary periods. So it's a very common phenomenon. And so this aroused a great deal of interest and activity in trying to explain this phenomenon that occurred in about a third of all red giant stars. Uh, Peter Wood maintained that it was the only unexplained type of large amplitude stellar variability known at this time. But there were a number of possible explanations uh, of which non-radial pulsation was one, possibly turnover of convection cells, uh, and quite possibly binarity, that it was some kind of eclipse phenomenon or something else. Uh, a lot of people worked very hard on it. One interesting thing, and this is harking back to the AVSO again, um, low mass yellow supergiant, stars that are in transit between the red giant uh, region and uh, the main sequence and white dwarfs do the same thing. 
And here we have something of the order of 10,000 days of data here. Every point is uh, an observation. This is the long secondary period in this starts, 2,500 days. In this case, this is known to be due to binarity, except that the eclipses change their character with time. So it isn't some constant object that's doing the eclipsing. It must be something that varies, such as a, a cloud of dust. But there was a, a kind of a, a red herring, and that is that when you made radial velocity variations, which is usually the way that you would detect binary motion, that when you took the velocity variations of the red giant, they all had a very unusual shape. They weren't sinusoidal. They had exactly this same shape, no matter which star that you looked at. And that meant that all these things not only had to have the same shape of the light curve, but they all had to be oriented in the same direction, uh, which makes absolutely no sense at all. So finally, um, a reasonable solution came along from Igor Sosinski and his colleagues in Poland who maintained with strong evidence that the long secondary period light changes are due to the presence of a dusty cloud orbiting the red giant together with a companion and obscuring the red giant once per orbit. So it was an eclipse. But the companion began as a planet and then accumulated mass from the wind of the star to become a brown dwarf or a low mass star which would produce the radial velocity variations that we see. And so here's an illustration of this. It's by Matilda Sosinska, who I assume, uh, since she's of age uh, 12 years old, that she's a young relative of, of Igor. And so this is what they proposed is going on. We've got our red giant star here. We've got a dust enshrouded companion here that's going around um, every LSP. So that's the long secondary period. And the strongest piece of evidence is when you observe this phenomenon in both the visual and the infrared. In the visual, you only get one cycle, uh, the one long period, uh, uh, long secondary period, which in this star is 417 days. But when you look in the infrared, there's a secondary eclipse halfway between the eclipses um, due to the uh, primary eclipse. And if we go back to look here, then that's because the dust enshrouded companion here is cool. It has a temperature of maybe a thousand degrees. And so it's an infrared source. And when it goes behind the red giant, this infrared source gets eclipsed. And so we get a second eclipse in the light curve here as well as the ones due to the eclipse of the red giant. Now, I've identified four problems with this theory here. Uh, the first is it seems rather puzzling to me that if a third or as many as a half, because some of these systems are going to be seen face on, in which case you won't see the eclipses, but uh, the star will still have the same configuration. Uh, well, these things must be among the bright nearby red giants that astronomers have been studying for 100 years. So it's rather puzzling to wonder why this phenomenon hasn't been discovered earlier. And it raises the second question, will the sun have a 50-50 chance of <clears throat> being an LSP star in the future? Something that should be looked into. Now, the second problem, which uh, a student and I have been working on this year, is that it turns out that there are many stars in which the long secondary period is dominant over the small amplitude pulsation period here. Uh, this is data from the All Skies uh, Automated uh, Survey for Supernovae, which we call Assassin. And in this particular star here, the pulsation period is 65 days, relatively short. Uh, the amplitude, as you can see, is only a tenth or two of a magnitude. But the long secondary period is much greater than that. Now, I mentioned earlier that short pulsation periods and small amplitudes were what's found in low luminosity red giants, ones that haven't yet reached the stage of having extensive mass loss 
which you would presumably need in order to uh, get the planet, the companion to accrete and become dust enshrouded. So th this doesn't make too much sense. And it's something that we're continuing to pursue. <clears throat> Another problem is that these long secondary periods are quite common in red giants in globular clusters. Now, you may know that globular clusters are ancient clusters in our galaxy that have very low abundances of the heavy elements, the ones higher than uh, the heavier than hydrogen and helium. Well, those are things that you would normally need to make planets and to make dust and so forth. So it's rather puzzling then that there's enough planetary precursors and dust present in these low metal SD systems uh, to produce lots and lots of uh, red giants and globular clusters that uh, uh, have the long secondary period phenomenon. Uh, this was something that was originally done by Tom Lebsalter and Peter Wood, and a couple of my students have been continuing this work using the assassin data. The fourth thing is that you'll notice that the sequences, and here I'm using data from uh, Suzinski et al. for the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud. And again, you see the sequences due to pulsation, the ABC sequences, and the D sequence, which is due to the long secondary period. Well, notice how tight this relationship here is. It's just as tight as the pulsation ones. Now, the pulsation uh, periods have a period luminosity relation because both the period and the luminosity depend very heavily on the radius of the star. But the long secondary period is the orbital period of the companion around the red giant. So the question is, why should the orbital rate, the radius of the uh, companion's orbit uh, be correlated with the luminosity? Now, uh, it turns out, in fact, it's a bit of a selection effect because if you read Sosinski's paper, he only chose for the LSP stars the ones that lie on this sequence here. So he actually deliberately left the other ones off. But we can go on to go back to Peter Wood's diagram. And again, you see that there's a narrow sequence here. So um, you can explain this by assuming that the orbit of the companion around the red giant is always about twice the radius of the red giant itself, which makes sense. I mean, it can't be much smaller than that, or the companion would be in the atmosphere of the red giant. And if it were too much more than that, then uh, maybe it would be hard for the companion to accrete material, or the chances of seeing it in an eclipsing situation at John would be uh, much less. So maybe there is a solution to that. So I just want to leave you with this uh, question that maybe you're asking anyway. Uh, why does all this matter? Is this just some esoteric thing that uh, professional astronomers do? Well, I mean, first of all, red giants are common. Look through your observer's handbook, Bright Stars, and you'll find that there's dozens and dozens of red giants. And someday the sun in five billion years uh, will become a red giant as well. So this is a, a apparently a common part of stellar evolution. Uh, the second thing is that apparently, if Suzinski's theory is correct, then the, uh, it requires the formation of planets, it requires the formation and accretion of dust. So maybe LSPs can provide useful information about um, these particular processes. And for me, it's interesting to think that maybe this century old mystery, which uh, both amateur and professional astronomers have contributed to uh, is finally solved. Well, not quite, so the work goes on. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I guess it's question time. Thank you very much, John, for a very insult insightful presentation. Um, let's see, any questions in the room? Yes, we have one. Let me get that microphone. Okay, so here comes the question. 
Oh, yeah. How large will these uh, dust and shrouded objects orbiting the giants be? Well, I guess if you believe that artist's conception, which must have passed Igor Sosinski's review, um, they are comparable in size to the red giant. But some of them may be smaller if the red giant is particularly large. Um, this is something that we can presumably figure out from the depth of the eclipses. And the depths of the eclipses uh, tend to be between a tenth and half of a magnitude, uh, which is not that much. So that suggests that uh, the size of the dust enshrouded companions is somewhat smaller than the uh, size of the red giant itself. That would be my guess. Okay. Thank you, John. Any more questions in the room? Yes, we have one more here in the room. So it sounds like your conclusion here is that these dust, uh, dusty companions are not likely to be the, uh, the cause of this uh, periodicity. Um, am I understanding that correctly, uh, or, or do you think it is? Uh -huh. Well, no, I, I, I really hope that Sosinski's uh, mechanism turns out to be correct. The evidence for it is really quite strong. It's just that these, there's these three or four loose ends that still need to be dealt with. Um, and the other thing, uh, I wrote a column about this in the RESC journal a year or two ago about the kinds of eclipsing stars in which the eclipser was actually uh, a dusty object. Uh, you can actually go back and look that up. One of the th kinds was the one I showed you of the yellow supergiant that had the 2500 day uh, eclipse uh, period. And I, in fact, devoted a paragraph or two to the long secondary period stars. So I think this kind of phenomenon is probably more common than we might have thought. And so I, I think I'll still bet on Susensky's theory. In spite of the, um, the, the, the likely lack of dust in globular, globular clusters and um, the, the fact that it's, 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 it just seems unlikely that these objects would persist uh, long mm -hmm. enough to affect so many red giant stars. But, but well, think it's, um, it, there's enough strength in the theory that it's likely? Yeah, because if you if you b believe Woods and Susinski, well, particularly Woods' survey using uh, uh, using Ogle and so forth, at any one time it looks like at least a third of red giants uh, have these long secondary periods. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think the other theories uh, work <laughs> any better. Uh, a lot of attention was given to non-radial pulsations, that is, ones more complicated than just an in-and-out motion, and they didn't seem to work either. So right now, the evidence seems to favor the Szynski uh, et al. Uh, uh, theory. So we just need to clear up these loose ends, and uh, that's what I'm doing right now, <laughs> and other people Thank you. are too. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Um, any more questions in the room? No. All right. How about online, Emma? Yes, you did get a question, a couple of questions online. Uh, the first one comes in from Zappa and Zappa and wants to know, will you get swamped with data when LSST starts observing? I'm sure that we'll get uh, swamped with data when LS, LSST gets uh, started, but uh, just because you have huge amounts of data doesn't necessarily mean that you can solve all of the problems. I mean, we had lots and lots of data in, in 1999 uh, from Wood's work and others and so forth, and it still took us uh, 20 years of, uh, of thought and lo of looking at individual stars, like me measuring radial velocities for a few. So often what happens is you get a huge survey and actually by studying specific stars, uh, you can get good information. And Andy earlier mentioned this, the, the idea of legacy stars in the AVSO, uh, that is choosing a few stars that you observe uh, intensively uh, with the idea of 
understanding them as, as well as possible. So yeah, I think there'll still be a place for uh, other kinds of observations. Well, that's great. Um, we got another question that came in from Ron McNaughton who wants to know, is there a pattern to the multiple of the long and short periods? Yes, the, uh, the ratio of the long secondary period uh, to the pulsation period tends to be either five or 10. And it tends to be five if the pulsation is in the fundamental mode, which is a longer mode. The first overtone, which is half of that, uh, if that's the pulsation mode, then the LSP over the pulsation period is 10. So uh, again, and this is going back to the business of the size of the companion's orbit compared to the red giant, uh, the, there is a kind of cookie cutter pattern to these things here. And always the red giant, uh, is, is a, the uh, companion's orbit is about twice the size of the red giant, uh, which produces this very nice uh, relationship which I showed you on the period luminosity relation and gives you this uh, ratio of either 10 or five. And a very few have a ratio of about 14, which would be stars that are pulsating in the second overtone, which is an even shorter one than the first overtone. Thank you, that's very interesting. Um... Ralph would like to know, would the dust and shrouded companions be pre-giant phase stars or already evolved compact objects? Uh, they would be either brown dwarf stars or very faint main, main sequence stars with dust around them. And uh, a very faint main sequence star is going to uh, take tens of billions of years to evolve into a, a red giant. Uh, a brown dwarf will will not evolve. It's uh, it's too small and uh, the, the core is too uh, cool uh, for nuclear burning to take place. So they're basically a small compact object surrounded by a cloud of dust that's been accre accreted from the red giant star. Well, that's very cool. Thank you very much. That's yes, awesome. it is very around. cool. That's what red giants are. Very cool. Thank you. Questions, I guess, online or in the room? Uh, John, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, oh, I wanted you. to say something that uh, right at the beginning of your talk, we didn't have <coughs> audio here in uh, the meeting room. So if you introduce yourself, we miss that. Now, I gather you're not a type of person who observes variable stars in the backyard with a four-inch telescope, are you? No, but I try and make good use of uh, observations that are made by those people who do that. <laughs> but uh, so, tell us, uh, tell us where, where you are, what you do, and so on. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm a supposedly retired professor uh, of astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Toronto. I'm an associate member of the Dunlap Observatory, uh, Dun 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 Dunlap Institute. Uh, my first 40 years were at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, where I was a founding faculty member. Uh, if you don't happen to know, I'm a former national president of the RESC, a former uh, honorary president, fellow of the RESC. So the RESC is in my bones. I, I edited the Observer's Handbook for 10 years. I have a column in the journal, which I hope everybody reads every two months. That's my introduction. I knew most of it except for the fact that you retire now. Oh. I can't hear you. Um, I, I knew most of what you said with the exception of the fact that you retired. I, I did not know that. And congrats. Um, on reaching. I, retired in, I retired in 2007. Did you? Oh, boy. Am I ever out of touch? <laughs> but I still supervise students. I still do research. I still do lots of outreach okay. uh, like tonight. And mm -hmm. uh, I do my column in the journal. Fantastic. Very good. Thank you, John, for taking the time. If you going to the General Assembly, I have a very interesting panel uh, discussion on, uh, uh, on Saturday afternoon. 
about misinformation in astronomy. So tune in if you're going to the general assembly. Okay, will do. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, John. Thank you. I'm going that to concludes... uh, drop off now. Okay. That concludes our speakers for this evening. And uh, before we move on to announcements uh, with Tom Luton, um, our uh, initial uh, uh, speaker, uh, Andy Beaton, uh, fact-checked himself on uh, the uh, period of our booties. Uh, and it's not, it wasn't uh, 13, uh, 223 uh, days. That's the period. So uh, not as short as uh, initially uh, mentioned. All right, so uh, let's move on to uh, Tom with the announcements. All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for coming out on this damp uh, Wednesday night, and I apologize for not joining you in person. Uh, I'm in, uh, out in Coburg at the moment, and uh, so let's get on into the announcements. So, for those of you who are joining us and are fairly new, uh, this is one of two types of meetings that we have here, uh, both online and in person. Uh, this was one of our recreational astronomy nights, and in two weeks' time, it's going to be one of our speaker nights. Those are still online only. Uh, if you are joining us uh, live on YouTube, please say hello in the chat, answer some questions for presenters as others have done. If you're a new member, please introduce yourself, and if you're coming to us from far, far away, let us know where you're coming from. So our next speaker's night and our last speaker's night um, for the season, and we take a break during the summer, so there won't be another one until September. Our next speaker's night is Wednesday, the 17th of May at 7.30 p.m., live here on YouTube. Connor W. Hayes, a Master of Science and a Ph.D., uh, candidate from York University will be discussing Water, Water Everywhere, a history of the hunt for lunar water from Harold Urey to Artemis and beyond. Right here live on YouTube. Then coming up at our next Recreational Astronomy Night uh, on Wednesday, the 7th of June, 7.30 p.m., both uh, in person at the Ontario Science Centre and online. Chris Vaughn will be discussing the sky this month. Dennis Gray will be discussing the Northeast Astronomy Forum, well, giving us a report on the Northeast Astronomy Forum, NEF. And Rusi Naff will be discussing the latest DART mission, did we move asteroid Dimorphos and briefings from the Planetary Defense Conference 2023? And if you have something you'd like to present, please contact us, uh, or please contact Paul Markov. Uh, just a reminder what John was saying earlier, uh, the RASC General Assembly is this weekend, uh, May 5th to 7th. Tickets are on sale at uh, raskga2023.ca. Coming up to the DDO in the next few weeks, on Friday, May the 5th, 9.30 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. is Astronomy Family Night. Uh, for uh, people uh, up to the age of 14, the cost is $15.69, and for people over the age of 15, the cost is $17.72. You can register online with links to be found at rasco.ca. Excuse me. Uh, coming up on Sunday, May 7th at 12.30 p.m. is Sunday Sun Gazing. Um, cost is $10 for those between 7 and 14, and for those over the age of 15, it's $11.30. You can, again, register online with the links at rasco.ca. Also coming up uh, on Sunday, May 13th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., the DDO will be part of Doors Open. Uh, we will probably have a call for volunteers uh, be made closer to the date. Now, our uh, observing sessions. The City Star Party is the is at Baby Village Park, uh, the first clear night of the week of May 22nd to the 25th, uh, with the exception of Wednesday night. We're skipping over, so Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday, whichever night is first uh, clear. 8 p.m. to 11 p.m., and then we're still working on a dark sky party location. Then coming up at on May 26th, it's uh, our next Millennium Square public stargazing event. Unfortunately, our last one was rained out. 
So from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m., join us in our sponsor, Durham Skies, for an evening of free public stargazing along the north shore of Lake Ontario at Millennium Square. Uh, observe the moon stars through our telescopes, check out the astronomy literature at our info booth, ask us some questions, bring along your own telescope, and we'll be happy to help you set it up and look at the moon. Uh, just a reminder that uh, things are usually cooler down by the lake, and we are still recommending the use of masks and to please... Uh, disinfect your hands. Uh, please check our website for a go no go decision based on the weather before heading to the square. Oh, and also with respect uh, uh, to the uh, uh, city star party at uh, Bayview Village, Bayridge Village, Bayview Village Park. And then we have another round of stargazing, this time up the DDO, the first clear night of the week of May 29th to June 2nd at sunset. Uh, no registration uh, required for this event. So, going on at the Carr Astronomical Observatory, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the road is now open and has been uh, cleared uh, and graded. Uh, so after the uh, work party that will be this weekend, um, uh, it's going to be open for business. Uh, access the CAO facilities by members or families only in a modified communal fashion with a total site occupancy limited to 25 individuals. The upstairs washroom is only for upstairs bookings. Maximum occupancy for upstairs bedrooms is two. The same family per bedroom for a total of six people. Communal areas are limited to three people with masks. All CAO users can use both kitchens, the downstairs washroom with masks. Full details are on the website. Please read everything before making your bookings. And then on Saturday, the May 13th of May at 2 p.m., ish. Uh, we will be having a new CAO users orientation session. If you've always wanted to use the CAO, this is your opportunity to learn how. Uh, you can register by email at cao at rasktio.ca. Now, uh, we're looking to fill some spots on the job board. Um, we are looking for a treasurer. This is a fairly uh, important uh, role, uh, and we're looking for someone with an accounting background uh, to fill this. We're also looking for a uh, education public outreach chair. We're looking for a light pollution committee chair. We're looking for a volunteer committee chair, a marketing committee chair, and some committee members. The education public outreach committee is always looking <coughs> for additional members, especially online presenters and some telescope camera operators for virtual star parties. Just a reminder that in order to volunteer, you must first be a member. Uh, Brief plug about the benefits of RASC membership. You can renew, sign up online at secure.rask.ca, and gift memberships are also available. Contact the national office at mempub at rask.ca. Now, one thing that uh, I regret not being there in person is that I don't get a chance to attend the meeting after the meeting. Uh, folks will be assembling at the Granite Brew Pub. That's 245 Eglinton Avenue East corner of Eglinton and Mount Pleasant. Uh, just plug that into your GPS or whatever app you're using. Uh, free underground parking with access off of Mount Pleasant Road. Uh, we are usually in the front. And for everyone else, I'd like to wish you all a very pleasant evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Please follow us on all the forms of social media we've got listed here. Uh, if you like what you saw here on YouTube, please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. Be safe and keep looking up. Good night, everybody.